folks, when is enough enough? How long is this TV brightness battle gonna go on? Is it gonna take full on retinal damage for someone to take their foot off the gas? Let's chat about that. Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison, and for those of us who live and breathe TVs, the fact that Samsung, LG, Sony, Philips, TCL, Hisense, and Vizio are all caught up in some kind of brightness battle, well, that isn't exactly news. I mean, my nit nerds know already, right? But where does it stop? Will it ever stop? It's like these TV brands are out here sword fighting, right? Or maybe a more apt metaphor would be lightsaber battle. I see your nits are as big as mine. But also, if you're just getting into some TV research and now you're starting to read and hear about nits and how this TV is brighter than that TV, and you're getting this feeling that brightness is some sort of yardstick for how good a TV is, then you might really wonder, well, how bright is bright enough? How many nits do I need? What's my nit need number? Folks, this is a video I've wanted to make for a long time. So let's talk about TV brightness, why it's important, how important it really is, and when enough is enough, or if it ever will be. Before we dive in, grab some shades because it's about to get lit up in this video. And if that sounds like fun, slap this video with a like, subscribe to see more. And as always, I can't wait to read your comments. Guys, your comments on the last video, thank you so much. Anyway, grab your favorite mechanical keyboard or just, you know, thumb things out on your phone and get to commenting. Let me know if I've managed to bust out the best beginning to a brightness briefing ever to hit your eyeballs, would ya? I think that's enough alliteration for now, so let's go. So to start, let's talk about nits. I don't know who came up with the term or picked it. <laughs> Get it? That's a dad pun if I ever wrote one. I really don't care though. I'm just glad we settled on something slightly more eloquent than foot Lamberts, which aside from not exactly rolling off the tongue, always reminded me of the story of Lambert the sheepish lion. Anyone? No, just me? showing my age once again. Anyway, nits are a measurement of brightness. When I measure a TV's light output using a spectrophotometer and or colorimeter, the result I get is in nits. And whenever I talk about how bright a TV can get, I express it in nits. So this HDR TV's peak brightness is 1000 nits, but this TV over here can push up to 1500 nits. And without knowing your nits from a nine inch nail, you can probably surmise that the higher number is more desirable. And on balance, it is, but I'm gonna get more into that. I just wanted to start by explaining the nit. And now that I have, let's talk about why brightness is valuable. What does brightness do for an image that makes us say, that's good, my eyes love to see it. Well, I think to keep things simple, we can say brightness helps us in two meaningful ways. One, it makes images generally easier to see. A bright image is easier to see in an already bright room. But also, brightness is on the positive end of contrast, and contrast is the most easily recognizable aspect of picture quality to the human eye. I'm not trying to harsh on your ophthalmic operativeness here, but your eyes are way better at perceiving contrast than they are at perceiving, say, color fidelity. The untrained eye is less likely to spot the fact that this shade of red just doesn't appear right, as it is to notice that the image in general either does or does not really seem to pop off the screen. Anyway, when you can have bright, sparkling elements on a screen commingling with dimmer or darker elements, you get contrast. And high contrast images are generally very pleasing, exciting even. Now, brightness in TVs today means something very different than it did just nine or 10 years ago. And that's because in 2014, we started getting HDR or high dynamic range TVs and the video that fed them, thus changing dramatically how brightness was used by a TV. You see, before we had HDR, we had SDR, standard dynamic range, and we were quite happy with it. But I'd argue that's because we didn't know what we were missing. Ignorance is bliss, right? No, it is not, but this isn't a philosophy video, so I'm gonna move on. The SDR standard was developed around the cathode ray tube TV, that's CRT. And if you saw my last video about every TV type explained, then you already know that this standard dates way, way back. The first CRT TV came out in 1934. Anyway, the SDR standard allowed for picture information sent to your TV in a range from 0.1 candelas per meter squared, AKA nits, that's your blackest, to 100 nits, that's your brightest and whitest. 
Now that doesn't mean that more modern SDR TVs like plasma TVs and LCD TVs could only put out 100 nits of brightness. It just meant that in SDR, TVs never got brightness information above 100 nits. From there, it's all about what the TV does with that information. And because we like bright images, what most TVs have done is just sort of raise the roof. So they would map out all the tones from 0.1 to 100 across a much broader range. Let's say from 0.1 all the way up to 700, which meant that the brightest elements of the picture would be put out at around 700 nits, while something that was coded for 80 nits might come out at like 450 and so on and so forth. They just slid the scale around. And this allowed us to have what we call high APL or average picture level. Even though SDR's max information for brightness was pretty low, we could still have a very bright picture. Let's now zoom to the HDR days, where we're at now. Now we can include information in a video signal that goes from 0.1 all the way up to 1000 or 4000. And if Dolby Vision had its way, it would go all the way up to 10,000 nits, which seems insane. And it kind of is, but there's some merit to the idea. I'll get to that. My point is that HDR kind of flipped the script on what brightness meant for a TV and its viewer. In the early days of HDR, most TVs could not get as bright as the information in the video signal, kind of the opposite of the SDR problem, right? So instead of tone mapping everything up, they had to tone it down to the operable range of the TV. So say we now have a TV with a peak brightness of 700 nits, right? The HDR video you watch was probably mastered up at around 1,000 nits. So what does a TV do with the 800, the 900, 1,000 nit video signal info if it can't actually go that high? it tones things down. Again, it's a sliding scale. The TV just maps it out so that you can still see everything. So the 1000 nit signal comes out as 700 nits, the 900 nit signal comes out at 625 nits, and so on and so forth. By the way, those tone mapping numbers may not be a reflection of reality. They're just here to help illustrate. Now, as you can imagine, folks wanted TVs that could do 1000 nits. At least if the video signal had it, they wanted their TVs to put it out. So eventually we got 1000 nit TVs and then 1500 nit TVs and 2000 and 3000. Now there are some TVs that can get even brighter, but they are few and far between. Point is that most HDR is mastered up to 1000 nits, sometimes up to 4000, but that's kind of rare. In many cases, HDR TVs can put out more brightness than the video signal calls for. But why would we want that? Well, let's go back to what I was saying before. The brighter the room, the more brightness you want from your TV so that the picture can still look like it has great contrast. And this brings back that APL or average picture level thing I was talking about earlier. The TV can just make everything it displays brighter for you so it's easier to see. But really for the best experience, you're viewing in a light controlled room. And all of that brightness power should, no needs, to be reserved for what we call specular highlights, or just highlights. You know, you see a shiny car with the sun reflecting off the chrome or something. That sun reflection, you want it to be very bright, but the rest of the image doesn't need to be insanely bright. In fact, it's better if it isn't because it makes that bright reflection have more impact. Because again, contrast. The more separation there is between a bright object and the surrounding objects, the more contrast and therefore the higher the visual impact. So in a brighter room, if you want that bright highlight to still have lots of impact, it's gonna need to be insanely bright in order for it to stand out against the high average picture level or just generally bright screen image. If your screen's average brightness level is already punching up into the 700 nit territory, then you'll need some serious power to make the highlight look bright against that. Now in a darker room or even one that just isn't soaked with sun, the need for brightness power really doesn't change. You want that power on tap, but how that power is used, that is everything. You know the saying, with great power comes great responsibility. Shout out Spider-Man. You don't want to be comfortably watching a movie all snuggled up with your snacks and your drinks, vibing on the couch, feeling pretty chill when all of a sudden, bam, that sun in the sky behind Maverick's plane is so bright, you're basically blinded. That's not a good experience. And because I know many of you have had that kind of experience, I know you might wonder why in the world would you ever want a TV that can get any brighter 
than the one that you maybe already own. Well, it comes down to that responsibility piece I just mentioned. It's fine if a TV can get super bright. It's just really important that the TV be smart enough to know where to route that brightness. A really smart TV, one with great image processing, will know that this one object is relatively tiny, so we can juice it way up so that it sparkles and has a high impact on screen. But this other object over here, it's pretty large, and if it gets too bright, it could really damage the picture or someone's eyeball. So let's not make that bigger part of the screen too bright. That, by the way, is my version of the TV processor's internal monologue. It may also lament not having access to four full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports, but I digress. So we come back around to the question I posed at the beginning of this video. When is enough enough? How much brightness do we really need? Well, for me, the answer to how much brightness do we really need is actually less important than asking the question, does the TV do a good job with all the brightness it has on tap. I mean, I'm fine if a TV can punch up to 4,000 nits, if that TV can keep that power reined in and deploy it only when it's needed. That way, it can be a ridiculously awesome bright room TV or even an outdoor TV, but it could also work well in the evenings or in darker rooms and save that peak brightness power for when it will have maximum impact while watching HDR content. Otherwise, you have a TV you can't comfortably watch at night, and that's just no good. And by the way, this is about bright colors as well as just pure bright white light, okay? Just wanted to make that clear. Now, OLED TVs are unlikely to ever be able to punch much above, say, 2,500 nits or so. The newest MLA OLEDs and QD OLEDs that were just announced at CES this year, those can punch into the 2,000 nit territory, which, by the way, is a serious feat of engineering. And since those TVs also have perfect black levels, the images that leap off those screens is liable to be epic. What I've seen so far was indeed epic. And because LED LCD TVs struggle to get perfect black levels, they can muscle in contrast with high brightness. But even though we've already discussed some limitations to how much brightness they can really use, one thing we have not talked about yet is whether they can even exert that kind of control. Because unless these LCD LED TVs have tens of thousands of mini LEDs in hundreds or thousands of control zones so that almost each individual backlight is addressable, you know, could be turned on or off or dimmed independently, then the feat of only lighting up the super bright object without lighting up all the stuff around it, that's gonna be really hard to achieve. Also, as those peak highlights get brighter, the more risk there is for halo and or blooming. So objects that are supposed to be dark won't end up being dark. Anyway, we've gotten this far and I just realized that we never really got into one of the other reasons we got into this brightness war in the first place. It's just plain one-upsmanship. I mean, OLED TV started raking in accolades and so QLED TV makers started saying, yeah, but can your OLED TVs get this bright? And OLED TV makers said, well, no, but we don't really need to, but we're gonna get brighter anyway for better HDR, and so on and so forth. And honestly, I don't see this ending anytime soon. The one-upsmanship will continue, the hurling around of huge nit numbers will go on, and hopefully the picture quality will actually benefit rather than this devolving into a petty metrics war. Because as soon as the value to the consumer begins to dim, that's when I'll start to balk at all this brightness business. Thanks as always for watching everyone. I hope you found this video informative and entertaining. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Don't forget to shoot me a comment down below. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.